The next speaker here is Sri Raj Rajendran. Um, hello, Sri Raj. <laughs> hey, hello. Good to, good to have you here. Uh, and, I'm um, happy to see. <laughs> so, the audience, I'm going to present Sri Raj to you. Uh, he joined the Elusi Data Lab series in June 2021, a very short time ago. As he and uh, as a data scientist, he's involved in industrial research and development projects, enabling machine learning based solutions addressing the needs of the Belgian industry. Sriraj is located in Belgium. Before joining Sirius, Sriraj was a postdoctoral researcher at uh, University of Leuven, and he obtained his uh, PhD degree from KU Leuven, Leuven, Leuven as you pronounce it, in electrical engineering, and he's a free and open software enthusiast and has a few years of experience in industry as a digital signal proce processing engineer in the telecommunication sector. So, as we uh, previously have done and as we're doing now, we have pre-recorded your contribution and I would like to hand over control to our video team. Please, video team, play Sri Raj's uh, contribution. Welcome to this talk on knowledge extraction from wireless spectrum data. Uh, I'm Srira Rajendran and I'm a postdoc in the electrical engineering department of um, K. Leuven. Um, so um, the idea of today's talk is to give you, an, uh, give you an overview about why spectrum knowledge is important and how you can attain this spectrum knowledge on an R scale. Um, I'll also give you an overview about um, wireless spectrum anomaly detection, uh, how you can do anomaly detection um, from, from a large amount of data that is available. We'll also talk about signal classification. Um, once we identify some signals, once we, once we have some signal, detect some signal, how we can uh, classify these signals uh, and how to uh, use some of the deep learning models to do that. Um, so previously in uh, last year's SDRA, there were there were there were a few talks on um, on cyclostationary analysis, uh, deep learning based wireless signal classification. So I'll I'll try to cover um, something extra uh, beyond that. So let's start with uh, why uh, why wireless spectrum knowledge is quite important. Um, instead of giving uh, you the complete spectrum allocation and other rules, uh, we'll try to go through a few solid scenarios um, where here where this is quite important. Um, let's think about an airport scenario where um, where the location and status are updated through wireless channels, um, for instance, ADSP messages um, or other uh, information that you send uh, that the flights send. Um, then uh, Think about uh, like surveillance radars, ATC communication. All these communication is happening over the over the wireless channel, and jamming and spoofing on these wireless channels is um, quite it's quite common. And there are many papers um, uh, which discusses these kind of attacks. Um, only in Belgium, like in 2019, there were around 23 reported radio interference issues from Belgian air traffic control. So this is, um, it's quite important to know how the spectrum behaves in um, in the uh, uh, aeros aerospace bands. Um, um, telecom operators, uh, they are trying to make the, uh, their um, cells quite densified for high throughput requirements. Um, Hence, cell, uh, hence, interference is also increasing. Uh, there are network outages. Um, there are people uh, deploying fake base stations using uh, easily available SDRs these days. Um, there are uh, people deploying signal boosters uh, again, which uh, affects the cell planning and um, and mobile. Mobile wireless interference is some of one of the prominent interferences that is reported in Belgium um, in past few years. Mm. Consider ISM bands, uh, where um, interference and usage analysis is quite important. For instance, there are companies uh, which make use of um, ISM bands for, uh, for instance, parking lot um, meters and kind of things. And they would like to know um, what is the usage statistics of these ISM bands, how much interference is present, and uh, how it behaves. Um, Defense sector is a no-brainer. No um, they they would they will always like to classify the NMS signal, localize it, um, identify it, decode it, and so spectrum knowledge in that domain is also quite important. 
again for end users um, and amateur uh, amateurs like uh, they would like to know um, the Wi-Fi channel statistics uh, how much radiation is there in the uh, some frequency bands uh, and all those use cases so spectrum knowledge is quite important for um, for a for a large variety of use cases um, and uh, and it's it's one of the problems that we are trying to uh, solve so currently how is it done in uh, in Belgium and other countries uh, like we have a few fixed monitoring stations um, um, in Belgium I think there are three or four fixed monitoring stations and um, there are a, a few mobile monitoring units also like these are vans that are equipped with SDRs and other high-end spectrum analyzers uh, to see where uh, from where the interference is happening um, oh, so uh, BAPT which is a um, which is a regulatory agency in Belgium. Uh, in last year, like in 2019, reported around 440 interference cases. Around 15,000 devices were seized. Uh, this includes devices, wireless devices, uh, in the, uh, that comes through the customs also. And also, there were around 500 monitoring visits um, based on the uh, based on the complaints uh, that were raised. So normally they do it um, in a in a manual fashion, like whenever there is an issue, someone logs a complaint, uh, and based on the complaint, they go there with their based on the priority, they go there with their van and with their equipment and try to do the analysis. So right now it's in a sub suboptimal um, uh, manual way, that, which is uh, now how how it is happening right now. So. Um, um, I also tried. We also tried to tackle this problem uh, when I started with my PhD here uh, in Kelvin. Um, so our idea was to come up with some set of crowdsource sensors uh, and uh, low-cost crowdsource sensors and try to um, get uh, data from the spectrum and analyze it. So, uh, um, so th this is a project um, called Electrosense, where which is which was uh, developed. Um, um, by the collaboration between um, various universities and research institutes. So Electrosense uh, is, is a non-profit organization. Um, MDI networks from Spain, servo systems from Germany, Armistice, and KLUN. So Electrosense consists of very low-cost um, sensors. Uh, basically, they are Raspberry Pis with um, RTL SDRs connected to it, and which is connected to the internet. And it sends data to the backend, and it sends backend where we run various services like um, classification, anomaly detection, uh, decoding, etc. Um, users can also get um, uh, this spectrum visualization, uh, spectrum usage statistics uh, from the interface, uh, and there are also some free decoders available to decode ADSP messages. Uh, via AM radio, FM radio, and all kind of things. So if you're interested, you can go to ultrasense.org uh, and all the source code for the sensor uh, and other algorithms are also available on GitHub. So this is how we started collecting data um, to analyze uh, wireless spectrum. And then uh, the challenge was to extract knowledge from these um, collected data. So we'll first start with anomaly detection. Um, so let's define what uh, what an anomaly is. So an anomaly can be anything. It's a it's a user specific issue. Uh, it can be jammers can be anomalies. New transmitters appearing in a particular frequency band can be an anomaly. Uh, transmitter parameter variations like power variations, frequency variations, um, etc. Can be an anomaly. A transmitter behaving uh, in an uh, in an unusual transmission with, a, with an unu unusual transmission pattern can be an anomaly. So any of these can be an anomaly. Um, why is it challenging? Uh, it's because, like uh, as I mentioned, the anomaly can be uh, a wide variety of things, and manual labeling of all these things in different frequency bands is quite difficult. Uh, because uh, wireless spectrum usage is quite complex and uh, in particular some frequency bands the rules are different uh, when compared to another band and the rules change from country to country also um, um, it, uh, upon upon that like there are sensor variations um, for instance even with very close by sensors there can be antenna variations uh, one antenna can be indoor and one can be outdoor and they see different um, kind of signals so in a supervised setups it's quite difficult to manually label this data and in an unsupervised setup, uh, we can we can say we can come up with a solution saying, okay, less frequent events are anomalous, um, which is a common way to do it. Uh, but again, it's not fully true in wireless scenario. For instance, uh, if you consider an ISM band, um, a less frequent event like um, a car key uh, wireless transmission 
um, it's not an anomaly, uh, but a pirate station that is transmitting for a few months uh, in, uh, that ends up in your data set um, can be an anomaly. So it's quite challenging um, in this sense. And our interest was to come up with a single anomaly detector uh, for for different frequency bands. Um, uh, so I, an anomaly detector should work across sensors and across various frequency bands. Um, we should also get some insights to the anomaly in which part of the spectrum it is happening and why is it happening. Um, and we wanted to do to, to some extent fully unsupervised anomaly detection. So we started uh, with a lot of sense data, um, try to um, detect um, anomalies using that. Um, so we uh, we started with a data set where the anomalous behavior uh, is quite low. Uh, we didn't do any explicit anomaly labeling and no expert feature extraction is performed. Um, so just to talk about the model, how the basic model works. The basic idea is um, similar to how kids learn. Uh, so consider you live in a, a city of dogs. Uh, and your kid only sees dogs. Uh, he or she learns a few features um, that uh, that that helps him to identify these dogs. Um, and suddenly, a cat appears uh, in the city, and because of the similarities, he thinks it's a dog. Um, it's what he learned, uh, but um, he thinks it's a dog. And uh, for an external uh, user, you can you can notice that the reconstruction error or the reproduction is. Uh, is quite bad. So from this, you can say whether it's an anomaly or not. This is the basic principle that we use in our models also. So we use um, autoencoder kind of deep learning models, uh, which consists of an encoder and a decoder, which brings the actual data into some features and tries to reconstruct uh, the actual input using the features. And uh, then uh, we train the model in a completely uh, unsupervised fashion. So uh, you can train this model based on the reconstruction laws. And whenever there is a um, huge reconstruction error, you can say that it's an anomaly. The good thing about these kind of models are you can also train them in a semi-supervised fashion so that like, so that you can say that some of these um, things are not anomaly, or you can also train them to learn some specific features, which help us to um, um, quantify the anomaly or understand why this anomaly is happening. So this is a basic idea, and this is our actual model. Uh, the model is called SAFE. Um, and it's an adversarial autoencoder-based model. Uh, I'm not going to the fine details of this adversarial autoencoder. Uh, um, it's, it's a very uh, um, famous structure, uh, which you can read, up, uh, re read about. So as I mentioned before, um, you have an encoder. Uh, we have an encoder and we have a decoder. We feed power spectral density data or spectrogram data as input to this model. And this is a reconstructed output. Um, and the model is trained on the reconstruction loss. Um, along with that, we impose a few distributions on the features. And we also have some semi-supervised um, features, uh, such as the class variable that identifies the frequency band. And whenever there is a huge reconstruction error or variations from this in the expected distribution, we say that it's an anomaly. Uh, the, so the model is also open source. Uh, you can uh, you can find it on GitHub. And uh, the details about the models are, uh, and, and some um, uh, advanced models are available in these two, these two papers. So let me um, show you a simple demo how it works. So what you see here is um, the spectrogram or uh, PSD input that is coming from an SDR, uh, from a hacker of uh, that is scanning 40 megahertz of the JSON spectrum. And on below, you see the anomalous regions. So top is the um, JSON band, and below is the anomalous region. So you can see the new transmitter appear here in the band, and suddenly it detects it as an anomaly. Um, so basically, what the models learn is like uh, the actual data distribution in a particular band. And whenever there is a variation from the, from the actual distribution, it detects detects it as an anomaly. Uh, you can uh, you can detect duty cycle variations um, uh, to some extent, uh, then uh, out of band transmissions, etc. Quite easily using this kind of models. And even if there is a jammer um, similar to this one, you can actually detect it quite well. So is this enough? Um, um, so this is a, this is the first step that we took, uh, but there were um, various other problems that needs to be solved. Um, for instance, how to handle sensor variations. Uh, as I mentioned, um, even if the sensors are quite close, uh, the signals that it sees might be quite different. 
um, for instance, like um, if you take two sensors in uh, two different locations and then uh, if you check the FM bands, the transmissions might be different in different bands at, at different frequencies. Um, similarly, um, an anomaly is also user specific. Um, uh, consider an example of a telecom scenario where they put a new base station, base station. For them, that transmission is not an anomaly, but for a normal user, it should be considered as an anomaly. So it's also user dependent. So we try to answer questions like how you can incorporate user feedback to this framework, um, how to use this expert feedback across users and across sensors. Um, I'm not going to the details and their details of this model, but uh, we have a completely complete framework uh, to attack to solve all these problems. And um, this again, this framework works um, on the same principles that I mentioned before. Uh, also, like we include some kind of semi supervision and use some traditional machine learning models um, uh, algorithms to uh, tackle these problems. So you can find the entire uh, framework there um, in this 2019 paper. Okay, so now um, we have some way to identify the anomalies. Uh, the next step is how to classify them. Huh? Um, so previously, uh, this was also a talk during uh, last SDRA, like um, uh, where, uh, uh, where the presenter presented um, cyclostationary based um, feature detection. And um, this kind of cyclostationary models um, were the conventional models that we used um, for wireless signal classification. Uh, basically, they it does some kind of um, similar to some kind of um, moment generation or correlation, and then try to find cyclic features from there. That's what it what these algorithms actually do. Uh, but right now, um, uh, we are using deep learning models, uh, which gives state of the art performance. Uh, we have proposed a few deep learning models, and there are some other state of the art models that performs quite well. Uh, the things um, that should the the models uh, that we propose should be robust against uh, all the uh, all the variations that we expect in 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 wireless, like uh, time shift variation, vari vari variance, channel variations, uh, symbol rate variations, and other parameter variations of the signal, which is quite challenging to achieve. Um, so um, during the last year's talk, there was also uh, uh, deep learning based. Uh, um, wireless signal classifiers i will talk about um, some of uh, some of the major issues of, with these kind of models uh, how it behaves uh, and why is it uh, why does in and in what perf what regions it doesn't perform really well so one of the main issue um, of this kind of uh, one of the main issues of these kind of models is generalization so these models work really well on the data it's trained for but whenever there is a change in some of the parameters, the models fail um, uh, miserably. So, um, for instance, um, here uh, in the on the right hand side, you can see uh, the accuracy drop for uh, three types of models, like um, uh, ResNet, 1D CNN, and um, feature-based higher-order cumulance-based models. So these are the state-of-the-art models, and and whenever there is a change in the channel condition, for example, for instance, uh, this is this is a section where the model is trained on AWGN channel and it moves to Rayleigh and Ricin channel. You can see that the accuracy drops are quite high. Um, the accuracy drops of um, the cumulant-based, feature-based models are quite low, but the actual accuracy of these models are also very low at low SNR conditions. So. Um, uh, so what I wanted to convey is like uh, whenever there is an out of distribution data, the models uh, fail, um, and it's uh, it's quite a problem in our in uh, uh, in our case also with electrosense data and other other data sets that we have. Um, uh, in order to uh, give you some examples, um, let us uh, let us consider the impact of app sampling. So what you see here is, um, is constellation diagrams um, of PPSK and QPSK signal. Um, so on the left-hand side, these are the signals where the um, model is trained on. On the, on the top, you see the conditions where the signals are tested on. Uh, so consider a BPSK signal, which is trained on AWGN channel with upsampling factor 8 and a sampling frequency uh, 200 kilohertz. But again, the same parameter, um, uh, it, uh, the constellation looks good and the features learned, uh, which are shown by these lines and these mm, dark points, it looks good and it's classified well, which is indicated by this green color. But if the upsampling frequency changes, uh, uh, sorry, the, the 
uh, if the assembly factor changes, uh, you can see that um, the classification is, goes wrong. Uh, even when you can clearly see like there is um, there is some it's, it's still a BPSK with some timing issue uh, and the model fails to see this so this kind of um, intelligence or causal reasoning is still not present in uh, in our models right now uh, right now we try to solve this problem uh, using um, using transfer learning and special transformer networks um, by Transfer learning, we mean like we use um, some a quite small percentage of data from the target domain uh, data set or in the, in the new from the new domain and try to use that to train your model. Uh, or similarly, we use spatial transformer networks to generate a new kind of data distribution from our actual data set. Uh, this can improve um, your uh, classification accuracy from 10 to 30 percentage. As you can see here um, on the left, um, here is a model that is trained on an assembling factor of uh, 8 uh, in three conditions, AWG and Rayleigh and Rayseyan. And, and you can see when the assembling factor changes, uh, the model accuracy drops. Uh, but if you use special transformer networks and transfer learning, uh, you can withstand uh, this uh, reduction to some extent. Uh, this is not a perfect solution, but uh, um, it uh, looks quite good. Uh, so the accuracy is quite low. Um, I, to 80 percentage because um, this is an average accuracy across uh, SNRs from minus 20 dB to 20 dB uh, and for around 20 uh, for a 20 class modulation data sets so 80 percentage is an average accuracy so if you go to the higher SNR region the accuracy is close to uh, 90 95 percentage um, we also make use of um, this kind of deep learning models for combined detection and classification in the sense um, uh, it's, it's similar to the models that you see in the image domain uh, where there are multiple objects and in an image and you try to detect uh, all these images uh, draw squares between these uh, around these images and uh, around these objects and try to classify them uh, we also have models to do that does that um, so for instance uh, for a drone detection problem we use again use this kind of YOLO kind of models uh, for uh, wireless uh, signal detection and prediction at the same time and the prediction accuracies are quite good uh, for uh, for uh, for different numbers of drones and you can see the F1 score here for very low SNR regions itself uh, it's quite good so uh, deep learning models and um, machine learning models are used quite well um, in all these scenarios um, uh, quite effectively uh, but again it uh, it lacks a few intelligent things that we can easily recognize so to conclude um, uh, data collection uh, wise um, for with uh, with frameworks like electrosense um, and crowdsource networks it uh, we can collect um, really good uh, spectrum data these days um, uh, we can uh, with, the, with the help of deep learning models um, we can we can do anomaly detection quite well uh, using unsupervised models uh, if you employ some kind of semi-supervision, we can improve the anomaly detection performance and you can Im uh, incorporate user feedback to these kind of networks. Uh, we can do quite fast signal classification these days using deep learning models from a few samples, uh, a few samples in the sense hundreds of samples, you can classify the signal fast. Um, and similarly, a lot of machine learning accelerators are available these days, like uh, Google Coral. So you can actually put these models on the edge itself and do the classification there. Again, these models suffer from model generalization issues and causal learning issues uh, because uh, some things that we can identify quite easily uh, as humans, um, still the models are not able to do that. And we have to induce these kind of causal uh, learning to these models. So once we have this kind of um, knowledge, um, uh, we make use of this knowledge um, for um, improving wireless transmission itself. For instance, we use these models uh, and spectrum data to do transmission prediction and inf interference prediction uh, and also classify the signals to understand in which region of the spectrum some particular users are appearing. And we use this information to improve the wireless transmission performance um, in a multi-user scenario also. So this is how we use uh, this kind of spectrum knowledge uh, uh, in the group. So thank you. Uh, that's it. And thanks for your time. OK, so thank you very much, Sriraj. This is a very, very interesting, very modern top topic you've been talking about. Um, I, I'm thinking of last year, you know, 
in, in last year's SRA, um, we already had this kind of topic, at least as a, well, from, from some speakers who contributed to that. Um, there was uh, Florian Brauchle uh, with an implementation and applications of the spectral correlation density, and we had uh, we had uh, Alberto Dasati and uh, Oscar R Rodriguez Salona about deep learning inference in GNU Radio with ONNX as a as an import export format um, for for artificial intelligence. Um, um, applications and um, and and well, we had these topics already. So we're seeing we're seeing a, a big development here, and something I'm very uh, well happy about is that we we have a an entire block now. We have four talks altogether on the field of artificial intelligence plus radio signal analysis. So. This is obviously a very interesting domain, a very interesting field of research. So, um, well, what what I've been thinking about is, okay, you're you're trying to classify signals, you're trying to train, uh, well, a neural network or whatever, uh, but generally, what you can do or what you generally do, well, I have a background in computational linguistics, so this is. This is from this is the perspective where I see it from. So you have a gold standard, and you're training a system, um, but the system will only learn things that it it's seen before uh, a certain number of times. Um, yep. The interesting part is where a completely new thing comes in, a thing that the system has not seen before. Um, this is one aspect. Um, the other aspect is um, from the the talk before uh, with Adrian and uh, also other talks before and yeah and uh, open WebRx uh, and the Kiwi SDR application where you have kind of um, 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 time difference of arrival location finding systems this is actually also something interesting and you know in amateur radio, we have we have this special sports of fox hunting, you know, where you have transmitters yep. in in the landscape out there, uh, distributed and well out there somewhere, right? And uh, I, I always figure out, hey, that could be interesting, uh, automatically finding them. <laughs> <Yeah>. And <laughs> okay, this obviously spoils the sport, but uh, it's an intellectual challenge. Right. So there are many interesting things around this topic, and I would like to thank you very much for this, for this contribution. Michael, you do we have question. some time for a question? Yeah, Siraj, uh, what do you think? Uh, maybe you have heard uh, of the radio uh, club uh, or the German radio club uh, project ENEMS, which is, uh, tries to identify the noise level uh, uh, on shortwave from 50 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz. And uh, there, uh, do you think that your uh, algorithm can be trained to identify several different noise sources, which could be VDSL, power line, uh, solar, uh, solar uh, power optimizers, and so on? Yeah, yeah, sure. Huh? Like you, you, you can, you can definitely do that. So if you have training data for those kind of, um, those kind of noise, uh, noise sources, we can, we can train them in a supervised fashion also to detect them. Even if you don't have like label data set that says, okay, this, this noise source is a particular um, from some solar panels or something like that. What you can still do is like you can train it as an uh, unsupervised anomaly detection problem and then try to localize these ones. So it's definitely doable. Um, and as an anomaly detection problem, you can do it for sure. No? Like um, and and the the code is kind of open source. So if you want to try it or if you need any help with that, I'll be glad to help also. Okay. Yeah. Well, your system is now limited to using a uh, RTL SDR and a an Raspberry Pi, as I uh, showed on the the website. Uh, and well, it, yeah, it yeah. would be nice uh, to have a deeper view on the shortwave uh, uh, spectrum, uh, as this yes. is very important uh, for the further use of uh, radio uh, sports or 
amateur radio on shortwave since uh, we have a lot of uh, influence by uh, several noise sources even the uh, home uh, electronic systems by power supplies and everything yeah so thank you yep. very much good idea and yep. uh, i will have a look on it yep thank you also big thanks from my side here uh interesting talk and we'll continue with the similar topics since we have an entire block of these topics now uh i'd like to welcome here uh Sriraj. we'll see you again in the panel then so we yep. can discuss yep. those things later on